The events of this report period combine to make it the most important period in the history of the manned spacecraft center. Three major space flights were accomplished, beginning with Apollo 9 in early March. This was the last of the Earth orbital flights in the Apollo program. Its major objectives were to test the lunar module, demonstrate the operational capability of the extravehicular mobility suit, and to acquire data in support of the rapidly growing Earth Resources program. At 72 hours into the mission, astronaut Schweikert opened the hatch of the lunar module and stepped out onto the front porch. The suit and the portable life support system worked well. Attached to the lunar module by only a safety tether, he was able to move about with relative ease, performing small tasks and taking pictures. Shortly after, astronaut Scott opened the command module hatch and stood up. Both men retrieved experimental thermal samples. Next day, the most important aspect of the mission. The lunar module was separated from the command module and flown to a predetermined point nearly 100 miles away. There, the spacecraft was put through a series of maneuvers duplicating those necessary to land on the moon and lift off to rendezvous with the command module. The entire operation was flawlessly conducted. Hey, I don't know if you had a chance to plot it out, but I don't think we got more than a pencil with, uh, with off the nominal line the whole time around. No, it, uh, you were right on all the way around, and it was, it was phenomenal the way uh, all the three solutions were coming together. It was, it was beautiful. The remaining five days were spent in testing and evaluating systems, subsystems, physiological and behavioral characteristics of men in space for extended periods of time. A great deal of attention was devoted to photographing parts of the Earth with conventional color film and with infrared sensitive film. This was the most extensive photographic mission performed to date, and the data acquired has had wide distribution to Earth scientists in this country and abroad. As the flight of Apollo 9 ended, Apollo 10 was in the final stages of launch preparation. Its mission, a complete simulation of the lunar mission, except for the actual lunar landing and surface activities. At approximately three hours into the flight and nearly 6,000 miles from Earth, the transposition and docking maneuver was performed. Although this intricate maneuver was accomplished according to plan and the spacecraft continued in its lunar trajectory, it is appropriate to note at this time that during the flight of Apollo 10, several problems of a technical nature did occur. Fiberglass particles from a broken insulation cover filtered into the command and lunar modules an undrilled vent plug that prevented depressurization of the docking tunnel, a malfunctioning switch in the command module transponder, a short period when the LEM steerable antenna was not tracking properly, and the unexpected but brief gyrations of the LEM at the moment of separation from its descent stage. It is also appropriate to note at this point that the time and money spent in training flight and ground personnel was amply repaid during this flight. In the spacecraft and at the mission operations control room, each emergency was met with swift and decisive action, resulting in on-the-spot fixes and successful mission completion. At approximately 60 miles above the moon, astronauts Stafford and Cernan separated from astronaut Young in the command module and began the maneuver that took them in two orbits around the moon and to within 47,000 feet of its surface. For the purpose of radio identification, the command module was called Charlie Brown, and the lunar module, Snoopy. Hello, Houston, Houston, this is Snoopy. Right, Snoop, go ahead. We is going, we is down among them, Charlie. Roger, I hear you weaving your way up the freeway. Uh, can you give me a postpone report, over? 
Yeah, as soon as I get my breath. Okay, our residual, our burn was on time. Coverage of the lunar surface by television and with film was extensive. Of particular interest was this area, the prime landing site for Apollo 11. Astronaut Stafford describes it. Yeah, okay, the approach end looks a lot smoother than some of the orbiter photos show. It's still estimated 25 to 30 percent a semi-clear area, so if uh, the limb has enough hover time, at least from what we could see at 50,000 feet, it should not be a problem. The orbital path of the LAM was closely studied by ground tracking stations and by the astronauts in order to gather more data on the localized magnetic anomalies noted during Apollo 8's orbital flight. Subsequent analysis of these data provided much improved navigation criteria for Apollo 11. In summary, the flight of Apollo 10 was a complete success. Every phase of the mission plan was accomplished. The data and experience derived from this flight set the stage for the lunar landing. At Cape Kennedy, even before Apollo 10 splashed down, Apollo 11 had been moved to the launch pad in preparation for its July 16th launch date. At the manned spacecraft center, astronaut training moved at an accelerated pace. Before a large group of top scientific and management personnel, Command pilot Armstrong and lunar module pilot Aldrin went through each step of their proposed lunar activities. Called the Lunar Timeline Studies, it required that they perform all of the activities of their two hour and 40 minutes extravehicular exploration of the moon. The duties included photographic documentation, gathering of contingency samples, deployment of a TV camera, deployment of a solar wind panel, Deployment of a laser ranging retro reflector. Deployment of a passive seismic package. And the gathering of rock, soil, and subsurface core samples. One item not included in the study, but added prior to launch, was the unfurling of the American flag. The last step was to hoist the sample return containers into the ascent stage. As it was later demonstrated, these actions with only minor variations were duplicated on the moon. A little later in the report period, Armstrong and Aldrin were joined by command module pilot Collins in the Gulf near Galveston for a recovery training exercise using special equipment and techniques to ensure biological isolation of the crew. Every effort is being made to protect the Earth from any living organisms that might be present on the moon. The first of these measures involved the astronauts immediately after splashdown. A Navy frogman clothed in a biological isolation garment called Big opened the hatch and handed three more to the men inside. The frogman also carried a spray can of antibacterial solution which he sprays on the astronauts himself and portions of the spacecraft. After being disinfected, the astronauts are lifted in the usual manner and carried to the recovery aircraft carrier. Another item of equipment directly related to the antibacteria precautions, the mobile quarantine facility, successfully completed acceptance testing at the manned spacecraft center during this report period. This is the facility that will house the astronauts and a staff of two in isolation from the rest of the world until they arrive at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory at Houston. The LRL, or Lunar Receiving Laboratory, was officially accepted in the early part of the year. For the purposes of this report, it should be noted that the LRL is the last major installation planned for the manned spacecraft center for the foreseeable future. As the mid-year point drew near, Apollo 11 was in the final phase of launch preparation. All events were proceeding on schedule, including astronaut training. Command pilot Armstrong journeyed to Ellington Air Force Base near Houston for a final dress rehearsal of one of the most critical and delicate maneuvers the lunar touchdown. For over an hour, Armstrong put the ungainly lunar landing training vehicle through its surprisingly graceful maneuvers, hovering, making sideways and rotational adjustments with his thrusters, and finally touching down. In all, six simulated landings were made during the test. The practice would serve him well in the days ahead. Finally, at Cape Kennedy on 16 July, Apollo 11 with astronauts Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins aboard began its flight to the moon. 10, 9, 
Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. At that precise moment, control passes to the mission operations control room at the manned spacecraft center. Apollo 11, Houston, you're good at one minute. If the spacecraft in flight is the heart of a mission, the nerve center is this tense room of low modulated voices, muted flickering lights, and electronic hum. Stand by for mode one, Charlie. Mark, mode one, Charlie. One, Charlie. This is Houston, you are go for staging. Inboard cutoff. Inboard engines out. Come inboard cutoff. And ignition. 11 Houston, thrust is go. All engines, you're looking good. All right, Roger, you're loud and clear, Houston. It is here that the radio and television circuits from the spacecraft terminate. From the moment of launch to recovery, teams of flight controllers, medical and systems experts maintain an undeviating 24-hour watch on the spacecraft and crew. 11 Houston. Go ahead. Uh, Mike, how about flight them Bravo at this time, and I'll give you uh, a comp configuration usually. Okay. 18 flight controllers, each an authority on some phase of operations. Watch, study, plan, and advise. Behind each, other experts are standing by. Thus, if a problem develops, several minds instantly converge on it. As well as two small TV monitors at each console, five large rear projection screens dominate the room. Maps, trajectory plots, systems information, and other data can be called from computers at the flick of a finger and displayed on any screen. Now, at 75 hours, 26 minutes into the flight, the astronauts in mission control prepare for LOI, lunar orbit insertion. The flight director checks his team of flight controllers. Okay, status check, go, no go for LOI, retro. We'll go flight all the way. Green ready. light, Fido. We're go flight, guidance. We're go with no attitude. Control, telecom, GNC. We're go. Ecom, are you go? Resurgent. We're go. O&P, AFD, FAO. Go. Green light, network. Recovery, I guess you're go. Right. Okay, Capcom, give me a green light, and we'll go for LOI. Roger. Apollo 11, this is Houston, over. Roger, go ahead, Houston, Apollo 11. Uh, 11, this is Houston, uh, you are go for LOI, over. Roger, go for LOI. The maneuver was smoothly performed, and the spacecraft went into orbit around the moon. On the 13th revolution, the lunar module separated from the command module and was nearing its moment of truth. Okay, all flight controllers, go, no, go for power descent. Retro? Go. Fido? Go. Guidance? Go. Control? Go. Telcom? Go. GNC? Go. Ecom? Go. Surgeon? Go. Capcom, we're go for power descent. Houston, if you read your go for power descent, over. Eagle, this is Columbia. Your go for PDI, and they uh, recommend you yaw right 10 degrees and try to hike high, high gate again. Right, we read you. Okay. And as millions throughout the world watched with anxiety and prayer, command pilot Armstrong and lunar module pilot Aldrin began the descent to the moon. At this point, the LEM was in automatic mode and flown by computer. As the spacecraft neared the surface and visibility improved, it became obvious that the landing site was filled with large boulders. Armstrong took manual control and steered the craft to a landing in a less hazardous area. Lights on. Down two and a half. 
forward. Forward. At 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Straight shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Ready? Down and a half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Good. Okay. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Engine arm off. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The sigh of relief around the world almost reached Tranquility Base. At approximately seven hours after touchdown, Armstrong emerged from the lunar module and climbed down the ladder. Immediate inspection showed the limb to be undamaged. It was found that movement in the lunar gravity was not difficult at all. After conducting the preliminary observations, photography and contingency sample gathering, Armstrong was joined by Aldrin and the two men proceeded with the planned EVA program. One of the first steps was to uncover a small plaque attached to the landing gear. One of the major highlights was the planting of the flag and a telephone call from the President of the United States. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call that could ever be. I just can't tell you how proud we all are of what you For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. After this historic ceremony was concluded, the astronauts deployed the scientific experiment package. The solar wind panel was in place. The laser reflector and passive seismic instrument were located. These activities alternated with periods of sample collection. After two hours and 32 minutes of EVA, the sample containers were hoisted aboard and the astronauts climbed into the ascent stage. All equipment not needed for Earth return was jettisoned, boots, backpacks, and so forth. It is interesting to note that the impact of these items on the lunar surface was picked up by the seismometer and duly recorded at mission control. After resting for several hours, the crew prepared for the maneuver that would lift them from the moon and into rendezvous with the orbiting command module. Tranquility Base, uh, Houston. Roger, go ahead. Uh, Roger, our guidance recommendation uh, is pings, and you're cleared for takeoff. Roger, understand. We're number one on the runway. Roger. Okay, master arm on. Guidance reports both navigation systems on Eagle are looking good. Whiskey blanks. Ascent and insertion into the rendezvous and docking trajectory was flawless. High above in the command module, astronaut Collins photographed the approaching lunar module.
Docking and transfer of the astronauts back to the command module was quickly accomplished. And with the spacecraft placed in its trans-Earth trajectory, the mission settled into the watchful routine that has become the hallmark of the Apollo flights. On board the carrier Hornet, steaming in the Pacific, President Nixon and his staff waited to welcome the first moon explorers. The moment of splashdown was a moment compounded of pride, relief, and a sense of accomplishment. And nowhere in the world was it as profound, and deservedly so, as in the Mission Operations Control Room at the Manned Spacecraft Center. After being picked up at the command module and still clothed in their biological isolation garments, the astronauts climbed from the helicopter and quickly made their way into the mobile quarantine facility. Once again, the president addressed the astronauts and conveyed the sentiment of the nation, and in fact, much of the world. Neil, Buzz, and Mike, I want you to know that I think I'm the luckiest man in the world. And I say this not only because I have the honor to be president of the United States, but particularly because I have the privilege of uh, speaking for so many and welcoming you back to Earth. The astronauts remained aboard the Hornet until it arrived at Hawaii. There they were airlifted to the Lunar Receiving Laboratory at the Manned Spacecraft Center. The two boxes containing nearly 60 pounds of lunar rock and soil samples were flown ahead on two separate aircraft. The boxes were opened in a vacuum chamber and were then moved to other laboratories for physical science measurements. The first inspection, a very preliminary one, by several NASA geologists was through a window at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. A technician removed the cover, revealing a number of small rocks covered with a fine textured gray and brown pottery substance. Little was learned of the moon's composition at this first visual inspection. Much is anticipated when the material has been thoroughly analyzed. To do this, NASA has arranged for pieces to be delivered to 142 principal investigators here and abroad. The following day, the crew of Apollo 11 arrived at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory and settled down for 18 days of isolation, observation, testing, and debriefings. As this report period ended, no physical ill effects had been observed. Preliminary conclusions indicate that the moon is biologically sterile. In total, the mission of Apollo 11 must be termed an unqualified success. It demonstrated that man can leave his planet, move through space with accuracy, land in an alien environment, move about with relative ease, and perform useful work. The instrumentation left on the moon continued to function at the end of the report period. After several days of searching, scientists finally zeroed in on the laser reflector and are now gathering data of great value. The seismometer has reported numerous disturbances and agitations on the moon. And the flag stands proud at the first way station of the universe. Thus, the first half of 1969 saw the fulfillment of a challenge made nearly nine years ago when President Kennedy announced the goal of putting a man on the moon in this decade. The part played by the Manned Spacecraft Center in achieving this goal was a large and important one. The growth of the space program from the early and widely spaced Mercury flights to the missions of Apollo 9, 10, and 11, all conducted during this report period, also reflects the growth of MSC. Although the goal has been met, it is now only the first goal. And in the years ahead, the space program will send its men and machines deeper into space, developing new technologies, new information that will benefit all mankind. Yeah.